We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. In him was life, and the life was life of the people. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have filled us with the new light of the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Let the light of our faith shine in all that we do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Happy that you're here for this uh, service of the bells. And if you have your bells with you today, feel free to ring them at any time during the service. Uh, ringing a bell is sort of like saying thank you to God for all the gifts that uh, he has given us. Before I forget it, there are a lot of beautiful poinsettias up here and this is our last service. And so those of you who have given a, a poinsettia, uh, feel free to take them home with you. In fact, even if you haven't given one, you can probably take one because nobody else will take them anyway. So I uh, have a uh, point set it today following the service. Pastor Dangerfield and his wife were on vacation and certainly it's a well-deserved time away. Christmas is a very uh, difficult time for most pastors and by the time it's over, they breathe a sigh of relief. And so we pray that God will give them a refreshing time and bring them safely back to us. Uh, here at St. Andrew. Please be sure and fill out your blue card that's in the bulletin this morning and leave it in the, um, uh, bullet in the offering plate later on. Uh, yesterday afternoon I conducted a 50th anniversary uh, reaffirmation re, uh, for Carlos and Marie Torres. And so we certainly want to congratulate them on, on um, taking their vows to each other. Uh, they're planning to become part of our congregation. I think these are the announcements this morning. We're glad that you're here once more. We pray that God will bless our time together. I have so, an announcement. We have an announcement. All right. I just realized I didn't put a thank you in the bulletin to Pastor Moberg for helping us out, not only today, but 365 days of the year. He's always willing to step in and do whatever's necessary, no matter how he feels at the moment, and we appreciate that, and thank you. Good. Thank you. A reading from Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will, accompany, will accomplish this. A reading from Micah. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Please rise. Holy Gospel is recorded in the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. 
The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Lord, help us today by thought and word and deed to bring honor and glory to the name of Christ and blessing and love and happiness into the lives of others, especially the dear people with whom we live. For we ask it in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, amen. Please take out the green uh, outline that you have in your bulletin this morning. We'll be using that as the, as the basis of our message. Um, the story that I just read from the Gospel of John is, is John's account of Christmas. It's totally different from Luke and Matthew's account. You don't hear about shepherds or you don't hear about wise men or stars or Elizabeth or um, any of the things that you usually uh, uh, associate with Christmas. And so it's a pretty fitting that on this, the last uh, Sunday more or less when we consider Christmas, that we look at John's story of Christmas. Now it's kind of theological or even, uh, it's even a, a little bit difficult to understand because John speaks in kind of spiritual terms. But what he is saying is that uh, Jesus Christ really didn't begin his existence in Bethlehem. He began his earthly existence, but he existed from the beginning of time. He was there in the beginning with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. In fact, he was there when God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God said, let there be a firmament, and he said, let there be a man and a woman, and let there be animals, and all the other things that God created in his world. Interesting, isn't it? He just said something, the word, and the Bible says it was so. God's word is powerful. Now, God could have left it at that. He could have created his world and then uh, never showed up. He could have never been a part of it. But God created the world for man, and he wanted to be a part of it in his own human flesh. And so that's what it's all about. God took himself in the form of Jesus Christ flesh at Bethlehem's manger. That's the incarnation, the coming into the flesh. But he calls himself the word, the logos in Greek, which means the, the revelation. It's important, isn't it? Words reveal things. If we didn't have words, we'd be, uh, of all people, probably most miserable. If you couldn't speak, um, if you couldn't hear, if you were totally uh, blind and deaf, you'd be totally isolated. You'd live in a world by yourself. It'd be a, a, a terrible world to live in. But God filled the world with words. So we have the Old Testament prophets and we have the New Testament gospels and the lessons of Paul and all the rest of it. These words reveal to us. They open up the way of God. They're the good news, the gospel. And that's the great gift that God gives us at Christmas time. He gives us his son so that we can have the hope of eternal life. It's a wonderful gift and without it, there would be no hope of salvation for any of us. And so God is a God who gives. Not only did he give in the beginning, he gave when the incarnation came and he's still giving, isn't he? He'll be giving till the end of time until all people who ever have lived on the earth have lived. That's the way God is, eternal. And so he is the word, and words are important. So that brings us to the first statement on your, on your sheet this morning, that words are very significant because with words, we can thank God for all of his blessings. With words, we can encourage people who are downhearted, or we can encourage people to come back uh, to faith if they have lost their way. With words, we can tell each other we love each other. Um, words are tremendously important. Without words, we wouldn't have Shakespeare and all his plays, we wouldn't have history. We'd be no better than animals because we have words and we can write those words down. We can create a history. We can create uh, something that happened years ago and still, in a sense, make it happen again today. So words are very important. And so we need to learn to use our words wisely because words can not only build up, but they can tear down. 
Someone once said, you know, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, uh, nobody really believes that, does it? Uh, maybe you remember some words that a friend said to you or a parent or maybe even an enemy that kind of re-echo in your mind because it hurt and it keeps on reminding of you of that hurt and so words can be hurtful as well as they can build up but God wants us to use words that build up and so he wants us to give each other the greatest gift that we can ever give the gifts that keep on giving you don't have to wrap them up you don't have to buy them at the department store you already have them you just have to give words of uh, graciousness to each other and that's what we want to do today learn words that will keep on giving in 2015 and all the rest of the years beyond that. Words are important, words that we share. And so we need to share words of thanksgiving. Well, that's not always easy, is it? You know, sometimes it's hard to say thank you, huh? Maybe we should practice when we're driving in the car, you know, saying thank you, or when you're shaving at the mirror, just practice saying thank you so, so it's not difficult for us. Um, those of you who have children and grandchildren know that when you give gifts, why well, it's kind of nice to receive a thank you note, isn't it? But if you're like our grandchildren, it doesn't happen very often. But uh, one little boy said, I write all kinds of thank you notes because when I write thank you notes, I get more gifts. Well, that's not the reason we do it, but we give thank you notes because we have received gifts. And so we need to learn how to say thank you. Thank you, honey, for choosing me out of all the, all the men in the world to be your husband. I really appreciate all you do for me in the house and how you take care of things and it's wonderful. Or the wife said, you know, I thank God every day that he gave me you as a husband. These are words that uh, we ought to say to each other regularly, shouldn't we? Because that makes a happy home. And so we learn to learn how to say thank you. We ought to teach our children how to do it and we ought to learn how to do it ourselves as well. So it's easy to forget to say thank you. Uh, a week or two ago, I was at Indian River Community College and, and I met Dr. John Southall. Dr. Southall is the director of orchestra and music at, at the college. And a few weeks ago, they presented a, a concert. He had a 60 piece orchestra that uh, played Christmas hymns and, and uh, carols. And at the end of it, he had the audience singing about it. It was very inspirational. And so when I met John in the hall, I said, I just wanted to thank you. Norm and I went to the concert and we were just thrilled with it. And it was the beginning of our preparation for Christmas. And he said, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, here's a man with a doctor's degree and all the other things that go with it. And he still appreciated someone saying thank you. Well, I guess we're never too old, are we? Or too young or too successful or whatever, not to appreciate saying thank you. We need to thank our children. Thank you for doing a good job in school and getting some good grades. And thank you for the way you clean your room. And, and uh, thank you for being such a, such a fine young person. Just think how all our kids will, will uh, respond to that. Well, that's better than uh, discouragement, isn't it? Discouragement. It is an old Western hymn, Home on the Range, and uh, part of the word is there's never a discouraging word and the uh, skies are not cloudy all day. That's the kind of home we'd like to live in, right? Not one where there are all kinds of discouraging words. Instead of saying to our son, you did a beautiful job, say something like, you know, you should have made that touchdown the other night, you messed up. Well, that's not a way to build a child up, is it? Uh, some time ago, uh, a football coach who uh, had a very successful team and he was in the playoffs, and he was interviewed by a reporter and he said, how do you do it? How do you make your team uh, be so forceful? And he said, you must give them a lot of encouragement. He said, I don't give them any encouragement at all. I give them grief. I chew them out when they don't do a good job. If you gave them all kinds of compliments, it would make them weak and they wouldn't produce at all. Well, he didn't make the playoffs because he hardly had enough players left for a baseball team when when most, some of his players left because they didn't like the way he was coaching. And so, you know, even professional football players like a word of encouragement. And so it's important that we thank each other, encourage each other. 
Well, that brings us to the second set of words on our outline this morning, words of fairness and unselfishness. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. It's not fair. It's not fair. She always gets the, the best piece of meat, best piece of meat. She always gets to watch her television program and I have to wait. This is not fair. Well, have you ever heard those words from your children? Well, life isn't fair, is it? And sometimes we're not very fair either. Um, sometimes we men are probably the most unfair at all. And so um, we're not always willing to admit that, uh, that we have been unfair. And when the smoke sometimes clears after an argument, why we finally say, well, I guess when I think about it, I, I wasn't really fair about it. If that happens, maybe your wife will have a little bit of a heart of the attack, but I'm sure that uh, she'll realize that, uh, that what you're saying is true. We're not always fair, are we? We don't always say the things that we, do, we should be saying. The Apostle Paul said, the good I would, I do not. And that which I do not, that I do. Well, if Paul had that kind of problem and he was one of the greatest uh, apostles and saints that ever lived, um, we can't uh, be surprised that we say things and do things that are unfair. And we sometimes need to be willing to, to admit that we've been unfair and try to do things to make them right. So we need to be more fair. We pastors probably haven't spoke about fairness enough. Well, the second word here is selfishness, selfishness. Again, because of the old Adam in us, we're all selfish. Some time ago, a Norwegian theologian came to this country and he was invited to speak at pastors' conferences. And he said to this with the pastors, you're not gonna like what I say to you, but I think Americans are the most selfish people around. Well, maybe he's right. He said, uh, they want what they want when they want it. And they don't care how they get it, how many people they have to step on. So, you know, sometimes it's easy to think that what we, what we want is the best thing for everybody and what we think is the best ideas for everybody. Well, it's not always true. We need to realize that, that uh, sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we're unfair. Sometimes we are selfish. And so the sooner we recognize that and try to ask God for help to deal with it, then maybe our homes will be happier and our workplaces will be better places to work and, and our neighbors will be nicer to us and we'll be nicer to them. So a word of, of fairness and a word of selflessness. These are good words that we can share with each other in the days that come. And finally, words of apology and forgiveness. Sometimes when I meet a uh, young couple planning to get married, I tell them there are two uh, words that you need to learn to say to each other regularly. And that is, I'm sorry and I forgive you. If you learn to make those magic words, you'll have gone a long ways to making your home a, a happy one. I'm sorry. Well, you know, for some people, it'd be easier to swallow an orange whole than to say, I'm sorry. It's just not the way that a lot of us think about it. We, we think the other person was wrong and, and uh, we play a little game. We say, if they've got to say they're sorry first and then if they say they're sorry, then I'll, then I'll ad admit that maybe I was a little wrong too. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? I had a, a secretary once that, uh, that hadn't spoken to her brother for 20 years. They had an argument way back when, and they, I don't think she even remembered what the argument was about, but they never spoke. Just think how much they lost over all those years. The friendship, the fellowship, the love they could have shared because somebody was too proud to say, I'm sorry. Well, not only do we have to say I'm sorry, but we have to say what? I forgive you. Jesus gives us a tremendous lesson, doesn't he? The very men that nailed him to the cross, he said what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I'm sure that a lot of our people could say about us, forgive him or her, because they don't have a clue what they're doing and what they're saying and what's happening because of what they do. So we need to be willing to say, I forgive you, not I'm going to forgive you this time, but never again. And uh, later on, I'll remind you of it. What did Jesus say? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. You need to forgive as many times as it's necessary. You need to clean the slate, forget about it. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, 
That's as far as God takes our sins from us. Though they be like scarlet, they shall be as snow. God forgives us. He's a loving, wonderful, forgiving God. What would happen if he kept track of every single sin that you and I ever committed and never forgot it, never forgave us? But thanks God that he gives us his love and forgiveness, and he gives it to us regularly. These are words that we need to give to each other regularly. Many years ago, when I was about eight years old, I wanted uh, a little toy train more than anything in the world, one of the little wind-up trains by Marx. And uh, my little five-year-old, my sister was five years younger. She wanted a doll, of course. And both of us knew that it probably wouldn't happen because this was depression. And uh, we thought maybe we wouldn't get it. But when Christmas came, we did receive the gift because our parents were the kind of people that thought of us rather than themselves. I should never start these things. <laughs> All right. Words of selfishness and, and apology and forgiveness. These are words we need to learn to say to each other. Words of gratitude, encouragement, fairness, unselfishness, apology, and forgiveness. If you learn to say those to each other and to your friends next year, not only will you have happy homes, but you'll have happy workplaces and even happy churches. So learn how to share these good words they'll keep on giving in the new year. Maybe that'd be a good resolution. And not only will we make other people happy, but you'll make yourself happy as well. May God bless us and give us the courage to do these things. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds to faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed are you, Prince of Peace. You rule the earth with truth and justice. Send the gift of peace to all nations of the world. Blessed are you, Son of Mary. You share our humanity. Have mercy on the sick, the dying, and all who suffer this day. Blessed are you, Son of God. You dwell among us as the Word made flesh. I'd like to read part of a preparation for Holy Communion that I've never read before, but it's so fitting for today. We give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in the end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim us in your will. He is your word, inseparable from you. Through him you created all things, and in him you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven in the virgin's womb. He is there to take our nature and our lot, who was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. It is he, the Lord Jesus, who fulfilled your will and won for you the a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free you from suffering. Those who trust you, it is he who was handed over to death. He freely accepted and in order to destroy death, to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush underfoot and give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant and show forth his resurrection. And that's introduction to the Lord's Supper. It's a fitting that, that this is the way the Lord prepared his people to receive this great blessing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.